we've got our B cell with the flag holder, MHC2, with the antigen binding, remember, to the T cell that was already activated previously. And this is where the magic happens. Do you ever wonder how once you get sick, how your body actually fights off that pathogen? Well, we're gonna go through that whole process today. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here, and today we're talking about infection to antibody production. So I want you to keep in mind these guys down here, they're called your B cells. And I remember these B cells produce antibodies. And these antibodies are tiny little proteins that are actually going to attach to specific pathogens like bacteria or viruses, and that will allow your body to actually fight it off. So for this example, I'm going to say this is the pathogen up here. And as you can see, the antibodies produced eventually by the B cells will fit perfectly, like a lock and a key, onto these little sections of the pathogen that are called the pathogen's antigens. And I want you to think of these antigens as tiny little identification flags. And the pathogen's basically waving this around saying, hey, I'm a pathogen, and we're going to use that to our advantage in making our antibodies to attach to them. So how does it all happen? Let's get started. First off, we're going to have these macrophages called dendritic cells. And macrophages is basically a fancy word meaning big eater. So as you can guess, it's a cell that's going to eat things, specifically pathogens. So what will happen is these dendritic cells that like to chill out around your skin and different connective tissue is going to capture these pathogens and actually draw that pathogen into its membrane through a process called endocytosis or phagocytosis, basically meaning into the cell. So it's bringing this pathogen into the cell. Now, once it does that, the dendritic cell is actually going to chop up this pathogen into tiny little bits. Now, we're going to zoom in on this dendritic cell right here to actually see what's happening inside of it once that pathogen is actually eaten. But before we do that, think about it. We don't have many dendritic cells, okay? But when you're infected with a pathogen, a disease-causing agent, that's what pathogen means, we don't have enough dendritic cells to actually fight this pathogen off. So remember, the key goal is to stimulate these guys to produce the antibodies because then we're going to win the victory against this pathogen. But this is just a small scale thing that's happening, but it will impact this process over here. So let's zoom in to that dendritic cell. And the way I've zoomed in on it is right here, this is going to be the nucleus of the dendritic cell. We're also going to have some rough endoplasmic reticulum dotted with these little dots. That's the professional term for them. And these dots are going to be called ribosomes. Now, how do these play into this process? Well, I mentioned that this pathogen is getting digested. So some of those antigens are actually going to pop off the bacteria and find their way inside of the cell. So now we've got the identification flags for the pathogen inside this dendritic cell. What do we do next? Well, in order to hold a flag, what do we need? Well, we need a type of flag holder, and that flag holder is called MHC2. And MHC stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. Basically meaning we, can, we are compatible with different tissues, and we're gonna see that later on with different cells here. But I want you to think of this MHC2 protein as a flag holder. Okay, so I mentioned this was a protein, right? Well, we know that proteins are made from the cells, specifically when the nucleus transcribes the DNA onto what's called mRNA. And that mRNA is single-stranded. It's got a lot of information on it. Think of it like a recipe book, right? And that recipe is going to travel to the ribosomes and get read into, specifically, that MHC2 protein. But then inside of this cell, specifically the Golgi apparatus, I'm not going to draw that, we're actually going to combine MHC2, this flag holder, with, you probably guessed it already, the flag of the pathogen. So now we have MHC2 holding on to the antigen from the pathogen. From there though, think about it, whenever you have a flag and a flag holder, where do you put it in terms of your house? Well, you usually put it outside of your house, right? So this complex is going to find its way from inside the cytoplasm and it's going to be transported to the outside membrane of the dendritic cell. So that way, since it's on the outside of the membrane, just like a flag's on the outside of your house, it's kind of telling the people outside, hey, you identify with America or whatever other flag that you're holding out. But in this case, holding the flag outside the cell allows us to then communicate with other cells. So keep that in mind. So once this dendritic cell's eaten that pathogen, processed it out, put it on the outside, it's actually going to travel or migrate to lymphatic tissue. This is a part of your lymphatic system. If you want to learn more about that, you can learn about it here. But one thing about the lymphatic tissue is that we have lymphocytes in the lymphatic tissue. What an idea. And the lymphocytes' names are either T cells or B cells. So we're taking this MHC2 antigen complex to some cells that can really help us fight off the pathogen. How does that work? Well, I'm going to draw that dendritic cell again over here, interacting with the helper T cell. So now you see that MHC2 with the antigen, and it's attached to two important protein receptors on the helper T cell. 
the top one that's actually holding on to the antigen is called a T-cell receptor. Now, one thing to note about these T-cell receptors is that they are incredibly diverse. They have all these different shapes and sizes so that we can bind to virtually any antigen from virtually any pathogen. There's literally billions of different combinations. So the dendritic cell will find the helper T-cell with the proper receptor to fit that antigen. Now, the second little thing you see here is called a CD4 protein, and that will actually connect directly to that MHC2 complex, as you see on the diagram. Now, one thing to remember from biology is anytime two things connect, there's some sort of change or shift in function. And specifically, when the CD4 matches with the MHC2, what will happen is the dendritic cell will begin producing molecules called interleukin-1. So interleukin, okay, that means between white proteins. So specifically, it's between a white blood cell, okay, being the lymphocyte, the helper T cell. And as you can see, there's some receptors over here called IL-1 receptors, being interleukin-1 receptors. And when interleukin actually binds to these receptors, it's going to stimulate these T cells to start dividing rapidly. But not only that, another thing that's going to help these T cells divide rapidly is through what's called an autocrine response where the helper T cell will actually make interleukin-2, IL-2, which will look like a triangle. And as you could guess, it binds directly to its own interleukin-2 receptors and further promotes this helper T cell to proliferate, divide, and start doing something. So I'm going to draw that next. So now we've got many, many, many helper T cells. I can continue dividing and dividing and dividing to help further this immune response. And now, keep in mind the goal, right? At the very beginning of this video, I mentioned we need to produce these antibodies, which are made by the B cells. But up until this point, we haven't mentioned anything about them, but we're getting there. Keep in mind, the helper T cell has the word helper attached to it. So they are going to help activate these B cells here in a second. Now, here's the problem. These B cells have no idea what the pathogen actually looks like. So we actually need to help activate them while all of this is occurring to trigger our helper T cells to proliferate so we can have a stronger immune response. So what's going to happen is inside the bloodstream, we're going to have some B cells. And we're also going to have some debris of pathogens. And as you can see, these are the pathogen antigens. Well, how did they get there? Well, during any immune response, you're going to start blowing up these pathogens like it's no tomorrow, right? And so some of that debris, some of those flags of the pathogen are actually going to get into the bloodstream where they can eventually come and interact with our B cell. Now, the B cell must have its own receptor called a B cell receptor. And they are going to be insanely, insanely diverse, just like our T cell receptor. So there's going to be certain B cells that have the perfect B cell receptor that will fit that antigen perfectly. So once that pathogen's antigen attaches to that B cell receptor, that antigen will be brought into the B cell via receptor-mediated endocytosis. Just a fancy word saying that the receptor is helping this B cell bring the antigen into its cell. Endocytosis, very similar to what we mentioned earlier with the dendritic cell, we're just bringing it into itself. Now, once we get that antigen inside of the B cell, hmm, Let's pause and think about this. When was the last time we saw the antigen being processed, that flag being processed, and put into a flag holder, right, to interact with a helper T cell? Well, we saw it obviously with the dendritic cell when we took that MHC2 and put the antigen into it. Guess what? If I were to zoom in on this B cell and how it processes that antigen, it would look exactly the same as it happened in the dendritic cell. So what will happen is this B cell will process the antigen, put it into the flag holder called MHC2, once again. Sorry, I need to draw this a little better. <laughs> so now, y'all, we've got our B cell with the flag holder, MHC2, with the antigen binding, remember, to the T cell that was already activated previously. And this is where the magic happens. Once these two bind, when CD4 attaches to that MHC2 complex, what can you guess will happen? Well, think about it. We want these B cells to start proliferating, right? Dividing and making those antibodies. So how do we get the T cells to divide and proliferate? Well, we release those interleukins. So this T cell, this helper T cell, is going to begin producing those interleukins. And as you can guess, they're going to bind to that B cell. And that is going to cause that B cell to divide rapidly. So I'm going to draw a couple of those B cells now. Now, most of these B cells are going to be called plasma B cells. And the reason they're called plasma B cells is they begin cranking out antibodies into the plasma, the fluid of the blood. 
So hooray, we've made those antibodies that we mentioned at the very beginning of this video. But at the same time, these B cells are smart. And they say, hey, what if we got infected with this uh, pathogen like 10 years down the road? Well, don't we want to remember how that pathogen looked so we can fight it off again? So therefore, one little branch of cells that divide it off will actually be called memory B cells. And these obviously will remember how to make those antibodies. So that way, many years down the road, if you get the same pathogen, those guys will kick into high gear, start dividing, making antibodies, and fight off that pathogen by attaching the antibodies to that antigen, thus neutralizing and targeting the pathogen for destruction. Now, if you want to learn more about this process of acquired adaptive immunity, I highly recommend you hop over to this video here.